The Forest Carbon Management Project of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions is a collaborative effort of uh, a number of universities and uh, uh, various agencies in provincial and federal governments, uh, including our team at the Pacific Forestry Center of the Canadian Forest Service in Victoria. Um, what I want to do this morning is speak to you about the role of forests and forest products in decarbonization. I will introduce uh, just briefly uh, some of the concepts of what we have been working on and then we'll hand it over to uh, the speakers who will present you with the details. Um, as we all know, climate change is real. 2016 was the hottest year on record and it was that again. It was the third year in a row that um, we recorded the warmest year on record. And in fact, in um, British in the world, we saw uh, very large increases in temperatures as had been predicted uh, many uh, decades ago. These temperature increases were highest in the north and in the continental regions. Uh, this is uh, the temperature anomaly for February 2017, so it's a, a one month average, not a single day. Um, and as you can see, we have temperatures that are well above four degrees centigrade higher than uh, the long-term average, the climate normal for 1951 to 1980. And we have many other maps like that of, of temperature increases in recent years. And as you will see, these are consistent with what global models predict. These are two results of the um, predicted future temperatures under two emission scenarios conducted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The left is the world that we strive to achieve with the Paris Agreement, a world in which temperature increases on average will be globally less than two degrees centigrade. The right is the world that it could be if we continue on the trajectory that we are on right now with the burning of fossil fuels and the increases of greenhouse gases in the global atmosphere. The choice is that of humanity. Humanity will also the su suffer the consequences of the choices that we make. Now there's some good news. Um, and that is uh, expressing itself in the trajectory of CO2 emissions that have occurred over the last years. And the good news is that after a period of exponential growth, we have seen in recent years a, uh, a leveling off in the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that is very largely due to the contributions that China has made in recent years, succeeding in uh, leveling off their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and there are certainly uh, uh, indications that they may have already peaked. Um, the other good news is that of the emissions that we add to the atmosphere every year, only about half, less than half in fact, is remaining there. Uh, as you can see here on the left, the two major sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere are fossil fuel burning and deforestation, that is the land use change of forest to non-forest land uses predominantly in tropical and subtropical regions around the world. Um, of these emissions, 44% remain in the atmosphere and the other, uh, others are taken up by forests globally and by oceans. Now, ocean uptake of carbon dioxide leads to ocean acidification, so this is not necessarily a desirable thing. And the other uh, thing that we don't know about very well is how long the global forest ecosystems will continue to operate as carbon sinks uh, into the future and whether that sink strength might be saturating and, uh, and leveling off or even declining in the future. So there's a lot of interest in uh, how we can uh, deal with carbon dioxide concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere. Humanity uh, got together in, uh, in Paris in 2018 and this was a real game changer in many ways because uh, 193 nations, including developing countries such as China and India, agreed to uh, a target of keeping temperature increases well below the two degrees centigrade. But what is also important for our community is that almost 150 countries uh, have recognized the importance of the land sector, that is the contribution of forest management and agricultural activities in achieving greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And the reason this is so important is expressed in this diagram, and that is that in order to achieve the cooler of the two worlds that you saw earlier, we need to be on the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions uh, the lowest of the trajectories of greenhouse gas uh, emissions or greenhouse gas concentrations, there is atmosphere that is shown on the left. If the CO2 concentrations follow the blue trajectory, the upper one on the right, then we get the, the hottest of the Earths that we saw in the earlier diagram. 
So that means two things. One is emissions from fossil fuel burning have to peak in the next decade and then decline. But more importantly, the emissions have to become net negative in the latter part of this century. And that is a term you will hear a lot more of in the coming decades, because what it means is that the human activities need to be able to, of removing more CO2 from the atmosphere than we're adding to it. If we fail to achieve that, then we cannot reach the goal of two degrees centigrade. So what, there are two ways of, of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. One is, of course, the uh, engineering approach of building facilities that extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, liquefy it, then pump it under the earth or uh, underground or, or turn it into other valuable products. And in fact, a price has been offered in 2015 to those who can develop new groundbreaking transformational approaches to converting CO2 emissions into valuable products. And those of us in the forestry community are looking at this and are going, well, wait, isn't this what we have been doing all along? Namely, turning carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, taking the carbon, storing it in biomass, releasing the oxygen back into the atmosphere, and eventually harvesting that wood and turning it into valuable products. Oops. So what I will speak about briefly are some of the analyses that we have done uh, by our team and, and team members will then go into more details um, about how forest sector climate change mitigation options may help contribute to affecting the greenhouse gas balance in British Columbia and Canada more broadly. Um, and in particular, how and whether we can contribute to the legislated greenhouse gas emission reduction target of 80% below 2007 levels by 2050. These analyses are conducted uh, at the scale of forest management units across British Columbia. There's 74 of these that we show on this map here. Um, and we apply existing models and tools to calculate based on inventory and growth and yield information uh, and information about forest disturbances and human activities, the greenhouse gas balance of these forests. We take a systems perspective, and what that means is that we do not focus only on how much carbon is stored in forest ecosystems, but following the guidance of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we look at the system as an entity. We need to understand carbon emissions and carbon storage from forest ecosystems. We need to account for, uh, estimate, report, and account for uh, carbon stocks and emissions associated with harvested wood products and their use, and that would include also bioenergy. And we need to uh, estimate and re report the changes in emissions from uh, substitution benefits. And what, what I mean by that is that if we use a wood-based product instead of an emissions intensive material like steel, concrete, plastics, aluminum, or other such materials, we can achieve a reduction in emissions because not only is the wood storing the carbon, that is the second bullet here, but we also have fewer emissions from wood use than we would have had we used concrete, steel, or, or other materials. And when we do mitigation analyses, we also need to always compare a business as usual base case against the mitigation activity so that we can uh, capture the additional, additionality or the impact of the mitigation action that we have implemented. We do this using the same framework or much of the same framework that we're also using for greenhouse gas reporting in British Columbia and Canada. We have a well-established carbon budget model that uh, estimates carbon stocks and greenhouse gas emissions and removals in forests. It counts for uh, carbon in biomass, in, in deadwood, in standing dead trees, in litter, in soil. So it does a, a full estimation of the carbon cycle in ecosystems. We keep track of how much carbon is harvested and transfer to wood products and biofuels. And we have a, a, a tool that allows us to estimate the fate of that carbon that was harvested in British Columbia or Canada, how much of that wood remains stored and how much of it is emitted uh, as these products are used or burned uh, as wood decays um, and ultimately is disposed of in landfills. And we have uh, tools to allow us to estimate the substitution benefits, the 
uh, impacts of using wood instead of fossil fuels and other products. And as you can appreciate, that depends on many factors. If you use wood to substitute for electricity in British Columbia, you have a very small substitution benefit because most of our electricity comes from uh, hydroelectricity. On the other hand, if you use uh, wood to generate electricity or heat in a, a remote off-grid community where uh, the electricity would alternatively produce by a, a diesel generator where the diesel is trucked in over long distances or even flown in with very high embodied emissions. Obviously, um, if you use wood there, the reduction in emissions uh, would be much greater than in the hydroelectric uh, situation. And so the same applies for products. What kind of wood products are used and what products they substitute uh, also makes uh, a big dif difference, can make a big difference. And so these tools try to estimate um, these substitution benefits. The focus of a lot of what we'll be talking about today is a particular study that is, is one of many, but one that was done specifically for this project for British Columbia. Uh, Zach will be uh, speaking to this uh, and Carolyn uh, in a few minutes after me. Um, but I just want to give you the highlight. Um, what this study does is it looked at a number of different climate change mitigation options in the forest sector, and we'll go through the details with, with Carolyn, with Carolyn's presentation. Um, it also looked at uh, alternatives of how we use the wood, uh, as that matters greatly as well. And we then uh, concluded that in British Columbia, 35% of the greenhouse gas emission reduction target for 2050 uh, can be contributed by the forest sector at a cost of less than $100 a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent and that there will be additional socioeconomic and, and ecological benefits. So $100 a ton may sound like a lot of money to you, but if you look at uh, the cost of climate change mitigation uh, in other sectors, uh, in particular that of carbon capture and storage facilities, they're currently operating in the range of two to $300 a ton. And of course, there will be technological improvement. Those costs will go down, but similarly, we will be able to identify also um, you know, more cost-effective ways of, of dealing with mitigation options. So the point are twofold. One is the forest sector contribution is meaningful in terms of its magnitude. And secondly, it's cost-effective. You'll see a few graphs later like this where we try to quantify the contribution uh, to the mitigation uh, into the components that um, uh, contributed uh, to this greenhouse gas emission reduction. So you'll see bar charts like this where uh, the scenario that was uh, explored is shown. So in this case, this first example, it's uh, the use of more long-lived wood products. So no change in harvest rates. It's just how we use the wood differs a little bit. We made a very conservative assumption saying that, well, what if 4% of the wood that would go to pulp and paper instead is used for more long-lived products like panels um, that you can also use in buildings so you can achieve some uh, substitution benefits through product displacement. And so what the bar shows is that the combined impact of these, uh, this change in activity would contribute by 2050 uh, a, a mere 3% of the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction target in British Columbia, but it's a very, very conservative and small uh, change that we made with just 4% of the pulp and paper being used for panels. And so you see here there are two colors. The, uh, the red is the benefit in the uh, harvested wood products, um, and so reduced emissions because you put the wood into more long-lived products and the darker blue is the benefit of product displacement of using panels instead of other materials. Another scenario that we will hear more about in detail is a harvest less scenario. Again, a very conservative assumption. We simply said relative to the baseline of projected harvest to 2050, we harvest 2% less. And now what you see is we have reduced emissions from the forest ecosystems, so they, we get a positive mitigation benefit there. Um, we have reduced emissions from harvested wood products because some of the material that we harvest is short-lived. But we also have uh, a, a small negative contribution, that's the dark blue line, the product displacement uh, that has, has a negative. And so the balance of these three is the, is the black line. It gets more complicated um, and more interesting when we start looking at a scenario where we use the residues that are currently left behind and some of them are burned for in, in slash piles. Uh, and instead of leaving them in the forest, we take them out of the forest. So now we have less residues that are decomposing there. So we have the contribution 
of reduced greenhouse gas emissions from the forest because we have fewer emissions there. But of course, we took that material out and we're now using it for bioenergy in this example. Um, what that gives us is the light blue. It's the product displacement benefit of having used the wood instead of fossil fuels uh, in, in to produce the energy. But because we burn those residues, we have negative uh, emission benefits. That's the uh, the red uh, blocks at the bottom that gives us the increased emissions from woody biomass. And so you see how the systems approach works by looking at the contribution of each component. And you see in this case, we can achieve 11% of the greenhouse gas emission reduction target. And then the last one that I just want to introduce briefly, and, and Carolyn and Zach will, will speak to more of these options. And the last example, we have uh, an increase uh, sorry, a portfolio of uh, doing what appear to be the best option in each of these 74 management units. We, we pick all those that have positive contributions and only use those and use in each management unit those that are the best. And sometimes we combine them, so more longer lived products with some of the other strategies. And now we get to 35% of the emission reductions, uh, partly by reducing emissions from forests, uh, increasing uh, the substitution benefits from energy displacement. There are also uh, positive and negative product displacement benefits. That's why there is no bar. They offset each other. So in some, some of the strategies lead to greater product displacement, others to less. And so that contribution is canceled out. And then we have, of course, uh, increased emissions from the harvested wood product sector because of, uh, in this case, largely the increased burning uh, for bioenergy. So it's a combination of increased long-lived wood products, more use for bioenergy, et cetera. And when you combine all that, you see that the portfolio that we have identified thus far, and, and we have many more options to look at, uh, can deliver 35% of BC's emission reduction target for, by 2050 if these mitigation activities are implemented soon and if they are sustained into the future. I like putting this picture in because when we talk about a million tons or a million cubic meters, uh, it's very hard to visualize. This is an example of the, uh, uh, this is a salvage locking operation in Sweden after a big wind throw event, but it shows a million cubic meters of wood or a, about a million tons of CO2 equivalent. And in British Columbia, we harvest every year about 70 times this amount. And what we do with this wood is, is hugely important. Just to put it in perspective, the amount of carbon dioxide that is in this wood that is taken out of forests and is re when the forests are regrowing, that carbon is removed from the atmosphere, that amount of carbon is, is about 65 megatons of carbon dioxide, which is roughly the same amount of the emissions from all other sectors in British Columbia. So what we do with this wood, how we use it, um, how we help it to decarbonize the fossil aspects of our economies, is hugely important and as is of course ensuring that forests regrow um, where they have been planted and harvested. So one of the things that we have learned in this work is that when we think about wood use, we need to think about two key indicators. One is how long will the carbon be retained in the products that we produce and the other, other one is how will the product that we have produced help us to displace uh, emissions from, from other products and fossil fuels. And so if we look at bioenergy, we're sort of at the lower left-hand corner. We have a range of possible displacement factors, some positive, some negative, and we have very short-lived carbon. If we go to paper packaging and panels, we sort of shift to the right with greater carbon retention time and higher displacement factors. Where we really can make a difference, though, is by looking at using the woods in, in the wood in long-lived structural building products because as we move from the lower left to the upper right, we achieve higher mitigation benefits. Now, some of these activities are linked together because as we produce uh, more structural building materials, we also produce uh, more cuttings and, and bark, et cetera, that we can use uh, for other purposes such as bioenergy to help further increase our mitigation benefits. So they should not be seen in isolation. And of course, we know this in British Columbia. We changed the building code in 2008 to allow uh, eight-story buildings. The Wood Innovation Design Center in Prince George is an example of that. It has, um, it was for the longest time the, the tallest building in North America. We now have uh, the tallest contemporary wooden building in the world with the 18-story uh, building at, at Brock's Commons in, uh, on UBC campus. The other question, of course, is then what do we do with, with uh, what well, there are other ways to reduce emissions? And one of the topics that we have been looking at uh, quite a bit is uh, possible alternate uses for wood that is currently left behind in forests and often burned for the purpose of 
reducing fire risks. These are uh, practices that cause significant greenhouse gas emissions without capturing the energy that is contained in these materials and obviously uh, an area in which climate change mitigations may be possible. I won't go into details, Robbie will speak to more of this, but one of the other things, of course, that we need to be mindful of is that there are both positive and negative impacts of climate change on growth, mortality, and disturbances. So understanding where, when, and how climate change impacts will occur in British Columbia is necessary to help us design the appropriate and effective climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. And so this PICS project is working towards this goal as well. Um, so in, in summary, and to set the stage for the other upcoming presentations, there are three big research team themes in the project, the design and evaluation of regionally differentiated climate change mitigation options, as well as the assessment of their uh, outcomes in terms of uh, economic and, uh, and other indicators. Um, the assessment of the impacts of climate change and uh, using that information to help us design adaptation and mitigation strategies to reduce these adverse impacts where they occur. And then the work that is led out of UBC with uh, design and evaluation of uh, policies, institutional and financing options for forest carbon mitigation options. And we will hear from George and Guillaume on that topic. So in conclusion, the uh, 2%, 2 degree goal of the Paris Agreement cannot be reached without uh, significant reductions in burnings of fossil fuels. I think that is, goes without saying. Uh, but also the important potential contribution of the global forest sector and the forest sector in British Columbia to contributing to, to net negative emissions. Um, the PICS research team therefore focuses on how the forest sector can mitigate climate change, how forests will respond to the changing environment, and what policies can help achieve mitigation objectives cost-effectively and with the support of the public. What our results have shown so far is that BC's forest sector can make significant contributions to climate change mitigation and that this contribution increases if the mitigation actions start soon and are sustained into the future. And with that, I thank you.